God, we quiet our hearts and minds this morning to tune into you and your spirit. In this moment, in this quiet, would you make yourself known to us? Would you train our eyes to see your presence and our ears to hear your voice? Together, Lord, hear our prayer. God, would you forgive us for believing that we have somehow earned what we have because we are better than others or have made better choices or somehow have your hand of blessing when others do not. We know that all that we have is by your grace and that your grace extends to all. Forgive us for the times that we have not extended the grace that we have been so freely given by you. We confess our sins to you. together. Lord, hear our prayer. God, we ask you for what we need this morning. We pray for those who feel like they are surrounded by enemy armies, for those who feel hemmed in by suffering and loss. Would you bring comfort? Would you sustain them with your presence? Will you answer the prayers of those who are asking for help, for provision, for guidance, for grace. We add our prayers to theirs in this moment and claim the verse from Psalm 34. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from trouble. We pray for what we need. together. Lord, hear our prayer. God, we pray for our city, our country, and our world. And this morning, we pray especially for Haiti as they enter crisis mode after another earthquake. Would you please bring the wonder of your presence to this situation, rescuing, helping, providing, and doing miracles? We pray for our city, our country, and our world. Together. Lord, hear our prayer. God, open our eyes to your wonder this week. Renew in us a sense of your love and care for this world and your ability to do the miraculous. And would you help us as your church to be a part of the miracle you are working on behalf of creation, the restoration of all things, by being the kind of people who love and who forgive. Amen. Uh, well, we are in episode nine of our teaching series, How to Wonder, the story of Elijah and Elisha on attempting and accepting miracles. We're going to be looking today at 2 Kings chapter 6. So if you have a copy of the scriptures with you, 
I would encourage you to open that up, or if you'd like to turn on your device, you can track along this morning. I think it'd be really helpful for you to be kind of tracking with the narrative as you read through 2 Kings chapter 6. So let's dive in. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, go. And one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. Okay, let's just pause for a moment. Quick survey of the people in the room. I'm interested to know, how many of you own an axe? Any, any, any axe owners? Not as many as I expected, but a few. It's good. For those of you who don't own an axe, maybe just peer around and figure out who you can borrow one from sometime. Um, Tara and I, we were camping uh, with our kids recently, and our, our son Theo and our daughter Penny were very serious throughout the entire weekend about chopping wood together with their cousins. It was just like nonstop getting those, it was like they were getting down to matchstick level after the weekend was finished. And if you can picture four kids under the age of 10 wielding axes and hatchets, you probably get a sense of the level of, of stress that Tara's mom was feeling throughout the entire weekend. We all finished off the weekend, toes and fingers in place, so we're okay. But, you know, camping is it's what it's about, right? It's chopping wood, firewood, splitting logs, all that kind of good stuff. Okay, so again, we've got people who own axes. Now, I'm interested to know in the room how many people here own a chainsaw. Okay, I see a, a, a less, but I, like now, these are the real people you want to be friends with, right? If you need to get your hands on a chainsaw, that's a little bit more of a bigger deal. I don't own a chainsaw, so... If I was going to pretend like I knew how to use a chainsaw, I would need to find one of these people and I'd need to borrow it. Now, have you ever borrowed something from a friend only to have it break? Or have you maybe borrowed something out to someone else only to have it returned broken or maybe not returned at all? Well, that's the situation that we're sort of jumping into here in 2 Kings 6. One of these guys on this little work project has borrowed an iron axe from a friend, and now he's lost it in the river. But keep in mind, iron tools were incredibly valuable and very rare at this time. So, so don't imagine you dropped one of your buddy's rusted hatchets in the river. Instead, imagine you've like borrowed your friend's premium like Husqvarna chainsaw and that thing has fallen in the river, okay? So we're tracking the level of severity in the situation. Let's continue on. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron hacks fell into the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried. It was borrowed. The man of God said, that's Elisha, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. And that's the end of the story. Dude just drops his friend's borrowed expensive iron axe head in the river, freaks out, and Elisha jumps in, throws a stick in the water, and the iron hack axe head just floats to the surface, and Elisha's like, go ahead, grab it. And nothing more is said about it. It's just literally told as if we're just supposed to be like, no big deal, that's cool. Now, if I'm honest... When I'm reading through the Bible and I come upon stories like this, I don't always know what to do with them. There's a part of me that, if I'm honest, just wants to kind of like slip on by and just like leave this stuff alone. And even if I was, as I was preparing for this message, I'll be honest and say that I was tempted to just like not read this, just skip past it and get to the other parts of the passage that just make more sense to me. Because like, how do you explain this? How did the iron head float upon the water? And, and why did this happen? Is there any significance to the story? Any deeper meaning we're meant to glean? Or is this just an example of the magical powers that Elisha was able to wield? I'm not always entirely sure how these kinds of stories fit with God's story. 
and how I'm supposed to understand God in light of this story. I don't know if any of you relate with me or not, but that's honestly how I, I feel sometimes. And if I'm, if I'm really honest with myself, I know that I'm uncomfortable with a passage like this because it makes me feel like God is maybe hard to understand. And I desperately want God to be small enough for me to understand. I, I don't want God to be beyond my understanding. I, I hate it when it feels like there are loose ends to my theology. It makes me uncomfortable when there are parts of God's story and God's character and God's activity that I can't explain. But friends, that's who the God of the Bible is. The God we worship, the God we trust, and the God we follow is beyond us. And we will not wrap our minds fully around who God is, and we will not fully grasp all that God is up to in our world. And yes, God did make himself fully known to us in the person of Jesus so that we can clearly see the essence of who God is, but we must never feel like we've got God all figured out. And this little narrative, this little story of the floating axe head is a reminder of the wonder of God. And sometimes we need to fight off the urge to rationalize everything, to explain everything. Wonders, as Brueggemann says, are not to be explained. They are to be wondered at. The Elisha narrative resists such explanation that detracts from the claim that here the inexplicable power of God is at work. So th this is uncomfortable for me, but friends, I offer little in ways of explanation as to what this little story means. Instead, I think it would be good for us as a community, me included very much, to learn what it means to simply wonder at the inexplicable power of God. And with that, the storyteller carries on. Now the king of Syria was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Syrians are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Syria. He summoned his officers and, and demanded of them, tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there, and they went by night and surrounded the city. Okay, so are, are you tracking with what's happening here? The, the Syrians are planning attacks on Israel, but Elisha has like insider intel, and he keeps tipping off the king of Israel so that they can avoid the attacks on the Syrians. And the Syrian king doesn't like this. So he's, he's sending his troops to go set Elisha straight, okay? When the, when the servant of the man got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us, are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So Elisha's servant sees the horses and the chariots and the strong force of the Syrian army and he starts to freak out. And Elisha calmly reassures him, don't worry, we've got them outnumbered. And then Elisha prays that God would open his eyes, that he might see. 
And the servant saw the hills full of these horses and chariots of fire, an image of God's presence and protection. When you look out at the world, what do you see? In particular, in moments of fear, anxiety, stress, what do you see? Do you see a world where the power of force and might are running the show? A world where those with the most horses and the most chariots are calling the shots? A world absent of God's power and presence? A world where God has lost control? See, this story, it, it echoes the words of Jesus found in Matthew 13. Jesus was using parables to unveil the mystery of the kingdom of God. And many people just, just they were not grasping the message that Jesus was communicating. They couldn't wrap their minds around a vision of a kingdom whose power was represented in little things like mustard seeds. A kingdom that was sprouting up in unexpected places like seed tossed among weeds or treasures found in fields. And Jesus said that it will be those with eyes to see and ears to hear who grasp what is truly going on in the world. Those who recognize God's power working amidst unexpected people in unexpected places. Because you see, those who only see the power dynamics of force and violence and money and control, according to the scriptures, are not clearly seeing the world. The servant saw himself surrounded by an army of horses and chariots. Elisha continued to see a world where the creator God reigns sovereign and supreme. So what world do we see? Who holds power over the world? Who are we afraid of? Who are you worried might have too much control, too much influence, too much sway over the direction of our society? Are you worried that the wrong people are calling the shots? Do you have eyes to see the king on his throne? Do you know who reigns supreme over creation? Can you see the signs of God's kingdom prevailing over darkness? Elisha recognizes that the Syrian army is of no concern compared to the might and power of Yahweh. The real question is, though, as the story continues, when we see that God is in control, how do we expect him to deal with our enemies? Continues on. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you were looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, Open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you've captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands from Syria stopped raiding Israel's territory. So given the chance to strike the enemy and to make a statement about the might and power of the God who protects Israel, Elisha instead instructs the king to feed them and to send them back to their home. And as a result, the Syrian army stopped invading the Israelites at least for a while. It's a, it's a powerful story of not returning violence for violence, but instead returning generosity for violence. Instead of a story of conquering enemies, this is a story about loving enemies. And, and we need to just actually take a moment and pause and, and really remember 
who the enemy is in this story. As we've been working our way through the stories of Elijah and Elisha in 1st and 2nd Kings, depending on the translation that you're tracking along with, there's probably been a lot of interaction with the Syrians. But I wonder, and I would actually like if anybody has a copy of the Bible open, is anybody noticing a different people group in these stories? Rather than Syrians, is anybody seeing a different name inserted in there? Well, I heard it. What was it? Arameans. Yeah, Arameans. So depending on like, what translation of the Bible you're reading, you'll see in some copies of the scriptures, they're described as the Arameans or the Syrians. And without getting too technical, the, the Aramean is, is essentially the ancient name for the modern day Syrian people. So some translations have decided to go with the ancient name, while others have chosen the more modern name. And if I'm honest, there's something in me that really wants to shy away from the Syrian title. Because in these narratives, they're the bad guys, right? And it makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I know people from Syria. And maybe you do too. Or maybe you're from Syria. Or maybe your family is from Syria. And portraying the Syrians as the enemy, it's, it's a little bit disconcerting to me, if I'm honest. Arameans, it feels more disconnected. A whole lot easier to villainize. But I've been reflecting on this recently and realizing how somehow I'm much more comfortable to villainize ancient people groups. I reduce these people down to the role they play as opponents to the good guys. And you might be familiar with some of these like infamous people groups in the Bible, like the Philistines or the Canaanites or the Ammonites. I'm not going to bump into a Canaanite or a Philistine on the street, so they're easier for me to villainize. I only know them as the enemy. And they're, they're, it's like, it's like I, th- I treat them almost like they're some of the fictitious enemy groups and places from a story like the Lord of the Rings, right? Like Mordor or Angmar or the Urukai. So to be honest, I, I kind of like the translations that use Arameans better because it's easier for me to take those people and to slot them into the enemy place alongside the good guys, the Israelites. The challenge is, this notion of good guys and bad guys, it does not fit with God's story as told in the Bible. The story of humanity as told in the scriptures declares that all humans are made in God's image. And the people of Israel were not chosen because of their heroism or their virtue. They were chosen to play an important role in helping all people rediscover their place in God's story. So the notion of of good guys and bad guys, it just doesn't fit with the history of humanity. And it certainly does not fit in our modern times. There may not be Philistines and Canaanites and Ammonites, but there are Iranians, Syrians, Turkish, Palestinian, American, French, Canadian peoples. And when we allow ourselves to treat ancient peoples as villains, we open ourselves up to the tendency to sort out our modern people in the same way. Good guys, bad guys. So this morning, you'll notice I've I've intentionally chosen the translation that says Syrians. And it actually helps me, and I hope it helps you to remember that even though there are people in this story who are participating in ways that are evil and destructive, they are themselves not the enemy. Because humans are never our enemy. As we learned in our study through the letter to the book of Ephesians, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark 
world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There are indeed forces of evil that are against God and are against God's purposes, but we cannot easily identify them as Syrians or Palestinians or conservatives or liberals. Will we find these people participating in ways of evil? Absolutely, in the exact same way that we will find ourselves at times giving in to temptation to ways of evil. See, that's actually what the people of Israel remind us of over and over again. Whenever we start to identify with a nation of Israel as like, you know, God's chosen people, we must allow their failures and their sin and their acts of evil to be reminders of our capability of failing just like any other person on this earth. So we, we have to be careful when we ask ourselves, who is our enemy? Who is against us? Whenever we place humans in our crosshairs, we have totally missed the point. And that doesn't mean we don't confront evil. Of course, we confront evil. Of course, we challenge ideas that we believe are damaging to others. We do all that we can to stop oppression, abuse, and violence. But whenever there are humans involved, we must always have their redemption and restoration on our imagination, our imagination and never their destruction. And this is why Jesus, he implores us in the way of enemy love in Luke 6. He says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you'd have them do to you. And friends, like it might seem unbelievable to some of us, but I actually believe Jesus meant what he said. This is not a sentiment. These are our marching orders. This is the way of God's kingdom. Because when we see the world clearly, we see the crucified king on his throne. And we remember that by laying down his life, he defeated evil. And we trust that his death was actually his victory because he came back to life. The resurrection of Jesus is our hope that God continues to reign supreme over creation. So we need not fear evil, but rather we confront evil with love in the same way that our Lord modeled for us. We love anyone who's opposed to us or opposed to the ways of God, who's partnering together with the ways of evil because we seek their liberation. And love is the way to conquer evil, as Jesus has taught us. We do not seek to destroy, but rather we work together with God for healing, for restoration. Elisha defeated his enemies by inviting them to the table. The Apostle Paul echoed the enemy-loving commands of Jesus in his letter to the church in Rome. To followers of Jesus who were located right in the heart of the ruling empire, he instructs them, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. 
In doing this, you'll heap burning coals in his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the vision for confronting evil in the world that we are given. Bless, do not curse. Strive for harmony and peace, even with those who seek to hurt us. Face hostility with hospitality. Overcome evil with good. And I'm convinced that as we as a community try to move in this direction, and especially as we try to like communicate this message to the world around us, time and time again, we are going to hear, it's not possible. I will never get along with that person. That group and that group will never agree on anything. The, the issues of this world cannot be resolved. Those people will always be enemies. You will never be able to change their mind on anything. You can't always work for peace by the ways of peace. Sometimes you just need to use force and violence to set things straight. Axe heads do not float. Whoever has the biggest army gets to call the shots and loving your enemies will never accomplish anything. And I think sometimes we just need to acknowledge that as Christ followers, we just see the world differently. We believe that the forces of power and might that are present in this world are nothing compared to the power and might of the creator of the universe. We believe that a good God had good intentions for this world and every person on this earth. And God is working to set all things right. We believe that God, in the person of Jesus, has shown us the way we are meant to live as humans in the world. He's shown us that evil is defeated by love. That's the world we see. So together, our invitation is to join with one another, to remind one another often of the reality of the world we are in, and to enter in and to do all we can to bring forth God's love and healing and redemption to dark places. The stories of the scriptures they're, they're scattered and they are sometimes hard to understand. And yet when we wonder at who God is and what he's done, we remember who sits on the throne. And I think today we can allow the story of Elisha to be our inspiration. Hospitality, defeating hostility. The way of enemy love is our way. Mm-hmm.